Hello, and welcome back to the Void Century Podcast, episode number 13. Ed and Adam here today to bring you chapter 979 of One Piece, Family Problems. Ed, do you want to take it away and start us off with a chapter? Yeah, so we start off with Orochi partying and getting drunk, and he's got all these serving ladies, and he's just feeling really good and confident right now. The narrator goes on explaining how he was tipped off with the plans of the scabbards from a well-drawn bird, so it's going to be Kanjiro. We see the bridges connecting Onigashima destroyed, and we see the beast pirates battleships guarding the waters around Onigashima. So yeah, Orochi is just feeling really good because he just has great news, he feels like the rebellion is all settled and squashed, and he's just in the mood to party. Meanwhile, Kinemon's leading the eastern forces while Denjiro is leading the southern forces, and those two forces combined are about 5,000 men strong. Also, Law has the submarine delivering the rest of the scabbards under the sea. Law looks really upset and frustrated and annoyed that he has these unwanted guests in the submarine. It's pretty funny. Next we pan in to see Kondro dragging Momo along, tied in a rope, and Momo's got his mouth covered, and they're inside the, the caves. And the reason they're there is they can't go through the main gate just because nobody knows that is a spy, except for Orochi. Maybe Kaido knows too. And he has to go through the secret tunnels to get there. There's some guards guarding the tunnels too but Kondro took them out, which kind of confirms that Kondro is pretty badass in terms of fighting. He can just easily take out, with no sweat, these guards that are guarding these secret tunnels. We see Momonosuke looking at the dead bodies, looking disturbed and sweating, but he also notices a dagger on the ground, and he's... He's eyeing it suspiciously. Next, we are back in Onigashima, and we see that the party is still going on, and they have no idea that there's a rebellion happening. We get back to the Straw Hats, and we see that Frankie has new toys. Um, so Frankie shows off his rhinoceros motorcycle and his brachio tank, and Jinbei comments saying that he remembers seeing these things on Fishman Island, and Frankie's like, yeah, but these are much more upgraded since then. Chopper is now Commander Chopper, and he is glistening, sparkling with pride because he gets to be the cool pilot of this awesome tank. Nami and Carrot are also swooning over Chopper in the Brachio tank. Frankie asks Jinbei about Luffy, and apparently Luffy is following the kid pirates because they just rushed in through the front door, and they don't know the plan, and they don't know how serious this- they have no idea what this means to Kinemon and his plan, so he's gonna go and try to help them. So the- the rest of the Straw Hat crew is like, this This is only going to make things worse. And, and he's like, yeah, but then Zoro also said that he's going to follow Luffy because it's only going to make things worse. And the rest of the pirates are like, Zoro's only going to get lost. So it's just, it's just funny because Jinbei hasn't been with the Straw Hats long enough to understand that Zoro and Luffy going off on their by themselves all alone is not necessarily the best idea for different reasons. It's just kind of growing pains getting used to the crew. So so Sanji climbs up to the tank and he's like, Nami, Nami, let me uh, get in the tank with you. And Nami's like, oh, sorry, the tank's full. And we got Chopper, Usopp, Nami, Carrot, and yeah, and Shinobu. <laughs> and we got Shinobu in there as well in the tank. So it's, it's a pretty packed tank. Shinobu's head alone takes up half the tank. So, um, and then... Frank asks Robin if she wants to ride in the back of his motorcycle, but Brooke thinks that he's asking him, so Brooke's like, no, I'm going to take the back of the motorcycle, and so it's just the two of them, so it's just Robin and Jinbei left behind, and they're just going to walk it out. Um, Robin, talking with Jinbei, and he's just saying how lively the crew seems to be, and he wants to just have a level head and observe the battle to make good decisions. He doesn't want to do poorly on his first group outing with the Straw Hats, and Robin's just like, man, you're so mature, and she's so happy that Jinbei joined. And then we hear some rustling in the bushes. Mysterious rustling in the bushes. And then it pans to Onigashima, and we see the Beast Pirates. And Ulti's swooning over Kaido, and she's like, oh my god, Kaido, long time no see, Senpai Kaido. And uh, we see page one in the corner actually making fun of her. And he's like, sis, you're totally breaking character right now. That's not like how a business lady acts. And Kaido being the smooth debonair guy he is, he's like, hey, are you all in enjoying those drinks? 
And then we see Sasaki, and he's like, Nah, man, I don't want to do any drinking with these scrubs, Kaido. I want to drink with you, Kaido Sem. We see the Toby Ropo all displayed in front of Kaido, and Kaido's like, Oh, we can drink later. I called you guys because I wanted to introduce you to Big Mom, but she's taking forever to change. That lady's huge. That kimono takes forever to get on. I'm just happy I don't have to dress her. And he's like, We could do that later. But while we were carrying on and talking, something's come up, and then that's why you guys had to wait. And Ulti's freaking out, and she's like, oh my god, why'd you make us wait? You're lame. Get it together, Kaido. And Page One's like freaking out, and he's like, sis, you realize who you're like yelling at here? And Kaido's like, oh no, 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 don't get it wrong. I'm not the one who summoned you here. And then the Flying Six are like, oh, well, if you didn't, who summoned us here? And we see King, you know, sitting there with his wings and his spikes everywhere. And he's like, dudes, I called for you. And we see, you know, King standing there being reintroduced. Everybody remembers he's a lead performer, which are the commander equivalents for the Beast Pirates. And we see a shot up of who's who and Sasaki looking at King. And they're like, it was you? This was your idea? And then King's like, ha, I knew you guys would never show up if you knew this was my idea. That's why I had Kaido summon you. And then Who's Who and Sasaki are looking shook. And King's like, you guys used to be captains of your own pirate crews. And I know that you wouldn't listen to me because you only listen to the big boss. And you guys want to be a lead performer. And then King goes on to state that the Beast Pirates is organized like a meritocracy, so the stronger you are, like we speculated, the higher you rank in the Beast Pirates. Uh, Sasaki and Who's Who are like, of course we're aiming high, you know, shut up and stay in your place, and Kaido's like, guys, we're celebrating, calm down and shut up. And then Kaido's like, King, just get on with it. Why'd you summon them? And King goes, Lord Kaido, I summon them because I got tipped off that your son isn't here. And Kaido's like, oh, good point. And then Kaido, I guess he has an assistant who's keeping his schedule. So we see Bao Huang, who's a little flying squirrel smile user. She gets down from the ceiling and she's like, yes, sir, Master Kaido. Queen is currently emceeing the show in the festival stage, and the lead performers in Fuku Rokuju will be holding a toast for you, and then you and Lord Orochi will be having a speech. And then after your speech, Lord Kaido, the Big Mom Pirates will arrive, and you will form the strongest pirate alliance ever conceived. And then you have a special announcement, Lord Kaido. Ulti's sitting there, and she's like, an apportment announcement? It's not like you to play coy, Master Kaido, what is it? And Kaido's like, ah, eh, well, if I led with my announcement, then it would only confuse you guys. He goes, in short, there's a task I want you to perform. I need you to find and bring back my idiot son, Yamato. So we got the name of Kaido's son, it's Yamato. And he goes, he disappeared earlier today. They're like, oh, that's such a formidable task. And they're like, I guess your announcement involves your son, Master Yamato? And Kaido's like, yes, of course. Ulti's like, dude, why am I here? I don't want to help you with your stupid, <laughs> your stupid family problems. And page one is like, sis, calm down, that's Kaido, shut up. We see who's who in Sasaki and they're like, what happens if we bring your son back safely? And Kaido's like... I will allow you to challenge one of the lead performers for their spot. Kaido's like, any complaints? And he's looking towards Jack and King that are there, and they're just looking stone-faced. And then everybody's cheering at the party. We see the Beast Pirates cheering for Queen, and we see Luffy. And he sees a guy from Udon Prison, and then in the next panel, Luffy's on this dude's head. And apparently he's running around the Beast Pirates at Onigashima looking for Kid and his crew. And he's literally sitting on the head of a guy he beat the crap out of at Udon Prison. And he's like, hey man, do you know Jaggy? And the dude's like, Jaggy? Who's Jaggy? And he's like, actually, you look kind of familiar. But he's absolutely plastered. And then we see a panel of Luffy outside. And he's like rummaging around the food table. And he's like, oh my god, this food looks delicious. And he gets hit in the head 
with a pot full of Oshiruko, and Luffy's like, Oshiruko, why would you hit me in the head with Oshiruko? This is ridiculous. And he sees it all over the floor, and then he looks and he sees some beast pirates that are like, oh my god, Oshiruko sucks, you can't eat Oshiruko while you're drinking. Like, Oshiruko's sweet, you need to be a man and eat something salty, sweet things you can't eat while you're drinking. So they're just throwing out all the Oshiruko and like dumping it in the street, and then dude has the bright idea of being like, Oh, we'll just throw it out in front of Okobore town, let it soak into the dirt. You know, those peasants will come right out and they'll lick the dirt dry with like a smile on their face. And Luffy is getting PTSD flashbacks to Tama on her birthday, finally getting to eat food and just breaking down and having a great time. And <laughs> Luffy gets real mad. Luffy gets pissed. We know how much Luffy hates people wasting food. Okay, I've, I've been hoping for the battle to happen for a long time. I think a lot of us have been. I think that the battle might be starting next week just because Luffy is about to get really upset and beat up these pirates right now. Ah, uh, dude, like, you've been calling that for weeks now? <laughs> that the battle's finally gonna start? Yeah, it's really heating up right now. I think Luffy's really pissed, and I feel like Law right now because I don't want... Luffy to actually just go bat crap crazy right now and start punching people. Yeah, exactly. Um, other than that, like, I guess we should probably start off by saying this is Mother's Day that we're recording this today, May 10th. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. So let's start off by kind of saying some stuff about some of our favorite mothers in One Piece. Okay, well let's preface it by saying that Oda doesn't really have a thing for moms in One Piece. There's not a lot of mothers in One Piece. There's a lot more like father figures in One Piece. So we only have a few, but of course we'll start off with the greatest, the largest even mother herself in the One Piece universe, the aptly named Big Mom. Big Mom out of any mother in the entire universe of One Piece, seems to have the most children. So that's pretty impressive. Bigu Mamu, I think she has like 43, at least 43 kids, because I know they have like, aren't there like the 33rd daughter and like the 33rd son of the Charlotte family? Imagine in the real world, if a woman could actually have over 40 children, like children over 40 years. Like, sorry, let me rephrase that. If there's over 40 children, right? So it takes about a year, let's say, to have a child. That's like over 40 years of giving birth or being pregnant. <laughs> you know, that's like, and imagine the real world. Let's say one person tried to have children over 40 years of her life. I feel like that's just not possible. <laughs> Most definitely, but again, there's a lot of things that are quite impossible in the One Piece universe. For instance, Dr. Kareha is like 150 years old. But Big Mom putting it in for the kids. She's got a whole country to support them. She does a great job, but she's not the nicest mother. I'd say she... Would you consider Big Mom a good mom? No, she's awful. She doesn't have the capacity to take care of and nurture all of her children. But even if she did have the capacity to do all of her children. I don't think she would. She's just too self, she has too much self-interest to care about someone else. She's a very poor mother. Okay, so emotionally, like, worst mom. But again, the kids have jobs. They got a place to live. Like, at least she conquered that part. Granted, they work for their mom, but still, I mean, some of the kids are actually happy working for Big Mom. The more normal ones don't really have crap to worry about. As long as, you know, they don't screw with her or else you get eaten. Definitely. Or your soul gets taken away. Okay, let's, let's move on. Okay, so let's move on to a better mom. Uh, a, maybe not a full-fledged mom, but definitely one of the best moms in One Piece, Nami's adoptive mother, Belmere. Yeah, so Belmere is probably, she's just a great example of in real life stepmothers or adoptive mothers foster mothers that sort of thing because she really did take nami as her own child and we got to show appreciation for mothers like that it doesn't matter if you're necessarily blood related you can still have that emotional connection that motherly mother-daughter connection with someone else 
um, that took care of you when you were a child and raised you and gave you a set of morals and ideals and helped prepare you against the hardships of the world. Most definitely. I think um, Belmere is a great example of an adoptive mother, you know, being there and literally sacrificing herself for her kids. I like to think in terms of like the Straw Hats backstory, the uh, father figure in the One Piece series that most relates to somebody like Belmere, I think would be Zeph. I mean, because Zeph physically sacrificed parts of his body for Sanji, you know, even though they don't have any blood relation. I completely agree, yeah. Belmere was a great mother for sure. I know that when reading Arlon Park for the first time and getting her backstory and seeing exactly what Arlon did, uh, it was devastating. Uh, I can't believe. I remember the first time I saw it too, I was in like my early teens and that and, you know, you don't see stuff like that in anime much. You know, Arlong sitting there in cold blood just putting one in between her eyes. It was devastating. In front of her kids, no less. Belmere, great mom. Yeah, very tragic. Speaking of tragic, we got Olvia. Olvia Robin, Nico Robin's mother, who also had a tragic ending. But, yeah, she was. She seemed to be a great mother that Robin, or that Nico Robin really loved. She looks just like her mother. See, I like the thing that really got me with Olvia is like, all right, so Olvia left to follow her husband when Robin was a kid. So that's why Robin hung out at the library with the archaeologist. Um, I went back to this recently because my girlfriend was reading One Piece for the first time and she got on Robin's backstory. And so I started to read a little bit with her. But one thing that I didn't remember that it really pointed out in Robin's backstory is there's a scene where Robin sees her mother after her mother comes back when the island's on fire and Robin after waiting all these years she just wants to make her mother proud and do whatever she can for her mother uh, she sees her mom walking through town and she's like mom 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 oh my god mom are you back is are you serious and we see the Marines and the marines know who olvia is and they're like hey olvia do you know this kid and olvia is like no this isn't my daughter like you're nobody i don't know who you are again it was to save robin but still at the same time it just pulled on my heartstrings good mom but really in a conflicting way yeah that's gotta be really tough to pretend that you're not someone's mother to save them even though you like uh Nico Robin really wanted her mother to respond to her and just give her that love, at least give her that loving smile one more time, but to just pretend that she didn't even know who the kid was. Um, yeah, Robin had no friends. Yeah, that too. Uh, again, we can, we can go to another great adoptive mother. I'd like to talk about Dr. Kareha, who actually took Chopper in. Yeah, she's a great mother too. She taught Chopper all of the his medicine skills, so that's the only reason why he can be such a great doctor is because of Kureha. Yeah, when Dr. Hiraluk passed away, well, was murdered, uh, she took Chopper in and basically she was a tough mother, but definitely a loving mother. Uh, she's very similar to Garp in her methodologies. Like, she's very strict, she's very conservative, but it's always in like a loving way. I mean, the fist of love. Yeah. Uh, so another really good mom, even though we don't know too much about her, I'd like to say uh, Porcus D. Rouge. She's the only female D we know in the series. And the only thing we really know about her is she was on the run for like two years or 18 months, something ridiculous. And she managed to hold Ace in her womb for that long again which is physically impossible in the real world but it's just to show like the feat of her willpower and what she was willing to do to like have her child and it's very tragic that Ace passed away and uh Porcus D. Rouge actually passed away in childbirth too so it's very yeah it really is but that's impressive it kind of reminds me of another series that I know called Dune where they have special it's a it's a sci-fi series i think you said you read it right adam yeah so there with. are there are these magical women called bunny jesuit they're called bunny jesuit witches actually and they also have a similar ability where they can hold a child in their womb longer um willfully do it longer than than isn't humanly possible 
but they could also do it shorter so they can give birth really quickly or they can drag it out really long. So it kind of reminds me of that to a, to a lesser degree because Bene Gesserit can probably hold a child in their womb for like a, over a year if they wanted, or sorry, over a couple of years even. Um, but yeah, Olvia or Porcas de Rouge, we don't, we don't get to see her. We just know that she was a lover of Goldie Roger. She probably would have loved Ace a lot, but she couldn't be there for him, unfortunately. Um, still though, you gotta, gotta love the mothers in One Piece because there's just so few of them. Yeah, I mean, Otohime too, again, is Shirahoshi's mom. Uh, she was actually killed right she was killed by humans yeah she was killed correctly. by humans and she's the what she was one of the biggest proponents of human peace with the fishmen and the humans kind of ruined it because she probably could have gotten them convinced to to do peace to have peace with humans eventually but then that main proponent of course was the one who was tragically killed by the humans so it's just going to double down on fishmen's fear of humans yeah, Jinbei is actually one of the people besides Shirahoshi and King Neptune who carry on Odohime's will. All she ever wanted was to make peace with the humans and fulfill the Joy Boy prophecy of living to the surface and like using the Noah to bring the fishman to the surface to see the light of the sun. It's just very unfortunate. Uh, speaking of unfortunate mothers, we have... Toki, again, uh, the most recent depiction of a mother we've seen in the One Piece story. Toki loved her kids very much. She loved her husband very much. She was a very dutiful wife. Um, she took arrows to protect her children instead of her husband's absence. Uh, she had the time time fruit. She was able to send her one of her children back in time to protect them. And she literally sacrificed herself for her family. She sent him in the future, not back in time, but yeah. And, uh... Oh, time powers, how do they work? Yeah, it's okay. And, yeah, she's a great... I mean, she really loved her husband, too. She was a mother first, but she also really loved her husband. And, I don't know, I, I feel like that's another important thing with, with a mother... Well, not necessarily important, but it, it's really nice to have when possible is that loving mother-father bond. And she really showed that um, that united front with her husband. They were always on the same page, even though it looked like Odin was doing something silly or whatever. We still had uh, Toki supporting him, being a great you know, motherly figure, even though like the children didn't know what was going on. She just made sure that they all... They both always saw their father in the best of light. Um, yeah, she's a, she's a great mother. Yeah, she she was totally the glue that held the family together. She she was extremely strong. Uh, she was extremely resolved, and she was willing to do whatever for her family, and she did. Um, I wanted to lead into the final one, if you don't mind. Yeah, you can go for it, but can you please explain to them what you're saying? Yeah, so the, the last mother is the most special. It's a meme. Let's be real. It's a meme. It's Crocodile. Crocodile is Luffy's mom. <laughs> For those who aren't aware, there is an infamous theory in One Piece land where people think that Ivankov, knowing something special about Crocodile, people think that the thing that Ivankov knows is that Crocodile used to be a woman and Ivanka changed her into a man and he became Crocodile. And furthermore, that Crocodile as a woman was Luffy's mother. <laughs> yeah, I believe I mentioned that before on the on the stream, but I think it's it's definitely an out there theory for sure. I mean, but you can't cut anything out. The only thing we could say is like, yeah, the part of Crocodile's face that doesn't have the scars looks pretty feminine. I mean, it's definitely way out there. I think Crocodile could have some kind of affiliations with the revolutionaries. But, I don't know. In terms of being Luffy's mother, I'm even more unsure. But, care to speculate on who else could be Luffy's mother? No. I honestly don't know. Um, actually, another mother that I 
we forgot to mention is I don't remember her name, but the person that Shanks Shanks is, has she's carrying Shanks's baby, I believe. Some... Oh, Makino, that baby was already born. If we are to believe that the cover story of Makino being pregnant and having a baby is coincidental to when Shanks left, it's very possible Makino could be a mother. Uh, we know that she likely could have a child together with Shanks. The timelines added up. I like to think at the end of the story, if Shanks passes away, that little baby gets a certain straw hat from a certain rubber man, but I don't know. I would love that. I would love that. I think it would be a super cool way to tie it all back. Speaking of family, uh, we got the name of Kaido's son today. It's Yamato. Uh, maybe his position could be ace. I think we're just hoping for things here, but there are two interesting things I'd like to point out. Maybe three. Yamato ran away. Okay. So, he willfully ran away from a party. So, I think it's really interesting to see that Kaido-san obviously doesn't want to be there. Doesn't really get along too well with his father. Kaido even referred to his father, to his son as my idiot son. So, I guess they don't get along. They don't really have like the same viewpoint on things. And they also referred to Yamato as Young Master Yamato. Very interesting that he has the same title as Momo. I'd like to think that they're similar in age. Yeah, it's looking more and more like your theory that Kaido's son is kind of like the black sheep. It's starting to pan out, and yeah, there, he's a young master, so I think that he might be around Momo's age. Um, still no idea who the mother could be and what he looks like even but yeah I'm, I'm starting to believe that there's gonna be a lot of parallels between kaido's son and momo and they're kind of they're gonna be kind of like the ana analogous children on opposite sides type of situation yeah but children at the end who have to grow up to become men but they don't have the capacity to be the same people that their fathers are or were yeah definitely so we also got another win we got a confirmation on the power structure of the beast pirate crew being based on strength yeah so we i i think that we really nailed it yesterday or the last episode where um yeah kaido just doesn't refer to anybody by their real names so literally they're just all different titles and that's it like for instance, King, he, we don't even know King's real name. Like, I'm sure that before he reached that rank of King, he had a different name. Same with Queen, same with Jack. But now that's just their name. Like, nobody even knows them by their real name anymore. Okay, here's something I like to think is pretty interesting. So, um, Big Mom knows King's race, right? King is supposed to be, like, the last person of his race. Uh, but he wears bondage gear, so nobody knows like what he really looks like. I think Big Mom, because she's so old and she used to hang out with Kaido back in the day, I think she's one of the people who knew King before he was King. I could see that, yeah. So she knows like what his real name is, and because she knows his real name, it was easier for her to figure out like his identity and where he came from kind of thing. Yeah, I could totally see that being a possibility. Um, it would also make her have more knowledge to try to recruit him not necessarily be more successful but potentially help out yeah most definitely uh they definitely go way back um i like to think that king and queen were probably hanging around kaido for a while like before they you know when kaido was still maybe even with the rocks pirates because if they're the rocks pirates i'd like to imagine that Whitebeard, Big Mom, and Kaido were kind of like the commanders on that crew. So they might have been a structure similar to Whitebeard's where the commanders have ships and like little crews under them that are all fall under the same banner. Yeah, I could totally see that. Um, uh, my guess is right now, just out of the information we have, that Kaido's crew is probably most similar to Rock's crew just because we know that Rock's, Rock's crew was very power-oriented as well, very chaotic. It just seems like, to me, it seems like this is kind of like the them carrying forward that type of crew into the present day. Um, another, I guess, 
pirate captain that could have a similar type of crew would be Blackbeard. Just because another reason is that I believe his boat is named after um, Zebek. So yeah, I think that he could also potentially have a similar type of structure as Rock D Zebek. Um, but yeah, as of now, it seems like Kaido is the closest thing that we've seen to that type of crew. And he's really just basing it off of his previous experiences. Definitely. But as we know with the Rocks Pirates, they split up due to dissent in the crew. Anytime you have a power structure that is simply based on power, like physical power, there's always going to be people that are going to be within the group to get strong, but not necessarily because they have the same ideals or the same morals. They just have power. So <clears throat> we could see somebody like Sanji is very strong and very opinionated. Somebody like Zoro is very strong and very opinionated. Without a crew structure and a captain like Luffy, there it would be an impossibility for them to be on the same crew. Luffy is what keeps them together. Again, if they were to join a crew like the Beast Pirates, where it's strictly solely based on power, they would have no reason to get along or be cohesive. They would just be fighting and bickering all the time, and that that actually hinders the full the full capability of your forces if they're fighting amongst each other all the time. Yeah, totally true. I also think that Kaido has less of a direction that he's going to compared to Blackbeard. So because there isn't that common goal uniting them, it potentially causes more issues within the crew and makes them a little less strong as a whole. That being said though, Kaido has so many people, so many devil fruits under him. He's still a Yonko, you know, after all. He's still going to be really powerful, despite the flaws in his crew. You know what I think why that is, though? So think of it in a crew like Kaido's, where they only respect power. I believe that the reason why Kaido can keep his crew together, even though they don't have any direction and they don't really have an end goal the way that we've seen it right now, is the fact that Kaido is strong. And if it came to it at the end of the day, if it was Kaido versus the rest of his crew, headliners and lead performers and small users included, Kaido would still beat them all. Yeah, I think he would. <laughs> that's just how ridiculous Kaido is. So maybe that's the reason why the Rocks crew split up, because after Rocks was defeated by Garp and Roger in their tag team, uh... Rox was defeated, obviously captured, then there was like a power vacuum, and they just all fought amongst each other, and since they were so equal on power, there was nobody strong enough to really fill the ranks, so the crew had to disband, which I think is the same thing that's going to happen if Kaido gets defeated. Well, when Kaido gets defeated. Absolutely. So, speaking of this, uh, we know that two members of the Flying Six, Who's Who and Sasaki, we know the Flying Six are going to complete their mission and find Yamato and bring him to Kaido. So, who do you think who's who's going to challenge and who do you think Sasaki's going to challenge in terms of the lead performers? And do you think it's going to be successful? Okay, so I'd just like to mention x first because I think that out of the Flying Six, x is the most powerful. So... Technically, he would be the most likely to be able to perform this task. I don't think he's going to capture, he's going to be the one who captures Yama, Yam, Yamato. But if he did, I don't think he would challenge anyone because he doesn't care for that power like he mentioned before. So he's less driven to, to do this, but also he's less driven because he doesn't want to necessarily help Kaido. So going back to your question, who's who? It seems like... Who's Who would challenge Queen, just because earlier they were in the previous chapter with the when they first introduced the Flying Six, they were talking about challenging Queen specifically, and Who's Who was the one whose face it popped up right after x Drake. So I'm thinking that that's who Who's Who would challenge, and I'm leaning to the fact that he won't be able to defeat Queen. I think that Queen's probably stronger if he did challenge him, but who knows, maybe... The Flying Six are actually just that strong. Um, and then Sasaki, I'm honestly not sure. I feel like he could potentially challenge King or Jack, 
I think that Jack is the weakest. I don't know why they wouldn't challenge Jack, but maybe they don't want to challenge Jack because that's the lowest of the lead performer titles, and they'd rather go for the glory and get the top or second best. I actually like to think that Sasaki would challenge Jack considering they're both fishmen. Oh, true. That's a good point, actually. I didn't think of that. I would like to think... So, I mean, my bigger question is, what's the deal with Sasaki and who's who's previous crews? Ha <laughs> ha! I say that ten times fast. But seriously, what's the deal? Um, because we know that they used to be captains. I like to think that, tying in the descent discussion from before, that they want to become lead performers because they don't like Kaido. Uh, they want to become lead performers to get closer to Kaido, much like what X Drake is doing, because I like to think Kaido did something similar to their crews that he did with Kid's crew. Uh, gave them smile fruits, didn't quite work out, and now they're completely useless personality-wise. Yeah, I think that that's definitely a strong possibility, too, that someone has ranked up that high in Kaido's rank, they never originally wanted to join the crew, and they don't have a particular fondness for Kaido. They're just kind of trying to get by, and it's very possible that someone that strong caught the eye and attention of Kaido and ranked up that high to become a Flying Six, but not necessarily actually care for Kaido. We already know that someone like X-Drake got up there, and he's not loyal to Kaido at all, actually. He's loyal to Sword and the Marines. So I think it's very plausible that the same could be said about a different Flying Six member, or members even. Had Kid succumbed and submitted to Kaido, I think he would be on Flying Six power level wise. We speculate that all the Flying Six are currently ancient zones or mythical zones. So we know that Captain Kid doesn't, he's got a Paramecia fruit. So we know that he wouldn't necessarily qualify in terms of power, not physical strength. I believe that his physical strength is on par with a member of the Flying Six. So I definitely think that Kaido would have given the spot to him. We see that Kaido tries to recruit captains from other pirate crews all the time, like he tried with Kid, like he tried with Luffy. So it's not uncommon, but again, you can see he's literally just bringing dissent into his crew. These people don't necessarily... Oh, go on. Also, if you recruit the captain of a pirate crew, by default, you're going to get their crew members as well. So targeting the captain like that is kind of smart on Kaido's end because it's more easy to convince the rest of the crew to join him once the, the top man is on board. Yeah, we saw something similar with how the Whitebeard Pirates absorbed Ace, Ace's old crew, the Spade Pirates. So we know stuff like that happens. The only thing is like, Ace joined after his descent went away and he realized why Whitebeard was so awesome and he was just this indomitable figure. Okay, with Kaido, what the point I'm trying to make is these people don't have any allegiances to him. Kaido is physically recruiting descent and the only, the only reason he can contain it all is because he can literally beat the rest of his crew in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. That, and that's not really the best way to maintain loyalty. So I think we're, we're already seeing ways that the Beast Pirates can lose this battle and how it will happen. There's going to be a lot of confusion. There's not going to be... Well, first off, they're also just going to be drunk, so they're going to be caught unaware and once they start losing morale because the beast pirates are used to winning all the time and if they start losing morale that's when loyalty and and discipline come into play and once they start losing that they're going to be starting to lose that discipline lose that loyalty and possibly run away or possibly join uh luffy's luffy's what's it called, fleet, or someone else's fleet, or just be good guys on Wano now because there's a new ruler, something like that. So I, we're just kind of seeing the the ways that Kaido can lose because, I mean, this is a shonen manga after all. We know that Kaido's going to lose. We know that Luffy's going to win. 
we just want to know how now at this point. I also think it speaks to the easy evaporation of the Beast Pirate crew once Kaido is defeated. We know if Big Mom is defeated, we know that the Big Mom pirates are going to stay stick around. There's going to be another member of the Charlotte family rising up because that's like a dynasty. I like to imagine Kaido's crew is just very volatile. As soon as something happens to Kaido, as soon as they feel like they're not in control and their allegiances flip, uh, Kaido is up a creek without a paddle. But it's because Kaido is so strong that we've never seen him tested, really, other than getting slashed by Odin, and he was fine after that. So, we see that uh, Frankie brought out some new vehicle upgrades for Wano. Uh, the Bighorn looks pretty cool. I like the motorcycle. I think we've seen the Brachio tank before, but this is like a new updated version. And definitely Battle Frankie Shogun's gotta be in Wano. What do you think, Ed? You down to see the Battle Frankie Shogun? Yeah, I'm wondering how they're gonna use it. We already know that Usopp is piloting it, and he's going to be the one who's going to be firing, shooting the ammunition out of the tank. We know that he's a sharpshooter, just like his dad, and he's gotten really good at it. So they're going to definitely be doing some sort of precise aiming with that tank. And also it's a means of transportation. One of the things that we haven't seen from Usopp either is the fact that in Dress Rosa, he unlocked his observation hockey, but then we haven't seen him. We haven't seen him use his observation hockey other than that one time, but now he's in the tank. True, yeah, so he might use his observation hockey to be a better sharpshooter than he already is, you know? Um, and we know that the tank is a vehicle, so I have a feeling that this group that is in the tank, so it's going to be Usopp, Nami, Chopper, Carrot, Shinobu, and Sanji riding on top of the tank. They're going to be going together somewhere, and they're going to be going at a faster speed than, let's say, Robin and Jinbei, just because those two are walking. So I think that it's safe to, or it's, uh, it's very likely that Sanji's going to jump off of the tank at some point and fight someone and break off from that group. Um, but yeah, anyway, sorry, back to the vehicle itself. I just think that it's going to be used mainly for transport and some cool tank stuff some cool tank stuff like there might be some sort of giant dinosaur that they're going to shoot with the tank or um, some type of structure that they have to blow up that's that's kind of how i see the tank being used i agree with you uh no not down on my boy chopper here but um i feel that the real efficacy of the tank is going to be the gun and being able to sit around and shoot accurately and not the pilot. So we knew Usopp is very experienced when it comes to shooting things because he's a sniper. Chopper is not really too experienced with driving machines. So I'm interested to see Commander Chopper work. Yeah. Yo, so Chopper's going to be the one who's driving and uh, Usopp's the one who's going to be firing. Is that is that what it is? Yeah, so okay. I, Chopper is the tank commander, so he's the one who does the driving, and Usopp is the one who does the firing. And then, and then we can look at the uh, the Bighorn, which is a motorcycle. So it's a two-man motorcycle. I'm going to guess that it's going to be loaded with a bunch of guns and stuff. The way I imagine this being used is something like Batman using his motorcycle, so it's just some cool stuff like that. Maybe some cool like maneuvering. This is going to be the most... The quickest of the vehicles or the of the two vehicles i should say and they're going to be zipping through getting to wherever destination they're trying to get to faster than anybody else um so yeah we're gonna have frankie and brooke traveling together i wouldn't be surprised knowing frankie if the motorcycle has the ability to transform further from a motorcycle to something else you know just just because that's, that's that's something frankie would do Definitely. I'd like to imagine Brooks on the back singing Highway to Hell, though. Yeah, right. Yeah, he's just going to be singing some type of encouraging music. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's going to be fun because now I think that the two of them are going to have a fight together with someone or someones, but they're going to be kind of tag teaming it. So it'll be cool. I don't think we've seen Frankie plus uh, Brooke tag team fight before. 
Oh, uh, no, I don't think we've seen one either. Again, uh, Brooke and Frankie joined rather late in the Straw Hats career, so... And the crew's gotten split up kind of a couple times, especially in the New World and with the time skip. So I don't think we've actually seen them together, much less use one of Frankie's robots. One of the cool things to think about, too, is I like to think that the Brachio tank and the Big Horn are going to meet up towards the end of the battle and they're going to transform into a bigger machine. Oh, I would love that. Like, Frankie's a fan of docking. Robin's the only straw hat that's not a fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um... I'm thinking that's how they could bring out like the battle Fra or the Frankie Battle Shogun, Battle Frankie Shogun, whatever it is, like Mark 2.0. I would love that. I I would be very happy to see it. I think that it's very possible for it to happen just because Oda and Frankie, just knowing the two of them, it's very very possible. Um, so we've already kind of talked about the two groups that are on the vehicles. But I also wanted to talk about the rest of the Straw Hats. So we have Robin and Jinbei, who are going to be grouping together. And then we have Zoro, who's alone, and Luffy, who's alone. So we kind of have the scene set for the Straw Hats, at least, on who's going to be together. Um, so now we kind of got to see who they're going to be fighting and what's going to prompt the fights. Like Luffy, we already know, is going to just start fighting. So... I wouldn't be surprised since he's in the middle of the party and we have Queen I'm seeing and Queen is also the jailhouse warden. I wouldn't be surprised if Luffy fights Queen first. What do you think? Luffy fighting Queen right off the bat in front of everybody at the party. I mean, nothing screams you're under attack. Yeah, I think if Oda decides to go that way, I think it would be a great start to the final battle. We know Luffy's always getting himself into a sticky situation, and they need the diversion. So I think it would be perfect, Luffy announcing he's going to beat up the Beast Pirates crew and kick all their butts on the microphone at the Beast Pirates party in front of all the Beast Pirates. Yeah, I, and again, it's just fitting because he was the warden. I think we're owed a Queen-Luffy fight at this point because it was kind of... We wanted it to happen in the jail, and it never happened, and... I just want to see him kick Queen's ass because we know at this point he's stronger than Queen. Like he, like Luffy has to be Yonko level at this point. Like he might not be able to beat Kaido one on one, but he could probably beat everyone under Kaido. I think so too. I would actually love to see Luffy one v one Queen over Oshiruko again. That would be hilarious. And also, it, it kind of is over Oshiruko already, the fact that Luffy is wanting to fight the Beast Pirates because they're wasting it. So, um, yeah, it's already over Oshiruko. It would be so poetic for it to lead into a battle with Kaido, or sorry, with Queen. Oh my god. You know what I just realized? So the last time we saw Queen before the party started, Queen was complaining that there wasn't enough Oshiruko and that Big Mom wanted some too. So they made too much and now they're throwing it out. What if Queen never got any Oshiruko and they threw it out and then Luffy's sitting there because he just got hit in the head with Oshiruko and Queen's like, oh, this is where my Oshiruko went? <laughs> and then he's blaming Luffy for eating it all again? That would be pretty funny. <laughs> I think it could be a good way to tie it back too. I'm more interested in like Zoro. So now Zoro has no idea what's going on. He's just wandering off by himself. He's obviously lost. So who's he going to cut? Yeah, for Zoro, I honestly don't know who he was. he's going to fight. Like, usually Zoro fights someone who is a swordsman in battles like this. And there are a lot of contenders because, like, who's who? He has swords. So, like, right now, my guess is who's who, just because he has swords. Um, and he's a flying six. I don't recall if king or queen or jack have swords i don't think they do um king has a oh, sword. king has a sword if king has a sword then it's very possible that he fights king i think it's possible he could fight king too but we also have everything that's going on with like the big mom pirates and we know luffy is it in the castle right now we've seen scenes of him in the castle we know zoro is lost so he's not in the castle. So I don't think Zoro right now would have a chance to fight any of the lead performers of the Flying Six. 
Yeah, um, unless he unless he conveniently gets lost in the castle, I think you're right. Yeah, like don't get me wrong, I'd love to see Zoro fight King, but I just don't think that it's happening like next chapter, you know. Oh no, I don't think any of these the only one that could potentially happen next chapter is Luffy fighting someone, not necessarily Queen. Other than that, nothing else is like likely, I don't think yet. <laughs> so we got to talk about the group with Robin and Jinbei. Who do you think was listening in the bushes? Yeah, I'm not sure. That's true. There was rustling in the bushes behind them. I don't know if it's going to be an ally or an enemy. Likely it's going to be an enemy just because it's sneaky. Um, and the only allies that we know of that would sneak are the two ninjas. And we already know where they are. Shinobu is in the tank and Raizo is in the submarine. So... I don't think it's an ally. I think it's someone on the Beast Pirate crew or some other force, maybe CP0, who knows? Could be. Those are all valid theories. Uh, it could also be a member of the Sun Pirates, though. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not as into that theory just because they, are, they just had their send-off with Jinbei. They had their going-away send-off, so it's like, why would the Sun Pirates have go through that extra effort of having that send off and then just be there right away you know who it could be too it could be kobe yeah that one i can see yeah i could see some other member of sword because kobe knows robin and i don't has kobe met jimbei i think they he saw they were there at marine Ford, but i don't think they ever spoke i'm not sure i mean it would be interesting too because kobe just escorted shirahoshi and king neptune so maybe he could talk to Jinbei about it, and he knows who Robin is. So, like, one of the other things to talk about, too, that was a little iffy is Momo and Kanjiro, and Momo checking out that dagger. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I 100% think that Momo snagged that dagger, and he's going to use it to try to escape. I think he did, too. Uh, my, my big theory is where he's smuggling it. And I like to imagine that he's going to smuggle it in his top knot. Yeah, I think that's not a bad idea. Bad idea. Just like a, a, assuming there's enough space for it, because Momo doesn't. Really, if you don't remember, Momo doesn't have that much hair. He's just he's got like the, most of the top of his head shaved, and then he's got like a knot. And there's not much to work with to hide. It's not like the longest top knot either. Um, I get it, but he can't hide it in his clothes. He doesn't even have a sheath for yeah, it. Yeah, the thing is, I don't know where else he could hide it. Like, maybe he could hide it underneath the rope that's he's in. But, again, it'd be difficult. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how he would hide it. So, Top Knot is better than any idea I have. <laughs> One of the interesting things about the scene with the dagger, too, I didn't register with me at first that he was looking at the dagger to pick it up. What really caught my eye is... The actual dagger itself and like the laughing on a monopia and it looked like there was something written out in like blood with the dagger so i just didn't understand that yeah i mean we know that conjure is kind of weird he used to collect like he was found by odin collecting dead human hair so he has a strange relationship with death with human death in particular um, so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he did some weird blood note. Um, do you think it could be like his true personality? I'm also interested to figure out whose knife that was too, because Conjuro doesn't look cut up. So I'd like to imagine that maybe it was his dagger, but Conjuro, I don't think would be foolish enough to leave like his dagger there unless he wrote a message for somebody in the blood. Yeah, that's, I was wondering that too. Um, I agree that it would just wouldn't it make sense for him to leave his own dagger there so it could have been the guards daggers like because i don't know i just i just know that guards typically or like japanese people back in the feudal days like that typically would have a small dagger for seppuku to perform seppuku if they needed to um so maybe he's making it look like they perform seppuku but again he's Kanjiro, like kaido and Orochi both wouldn't care if he like had to kill some some minions that again they don't care about. If they're weak enough to get one shot of Iconjuro, low diff, like why would they care about him, you know? But they were beast pirates. And uh Kaido doesn't know who Conjuro is or like what he does. He just 
knows of him as a scabbard. Because when we saw Orochi introducing uh, Kanjiro as the traitor, we never, like, he never actually told Kaido what Kanjiro's name was. He just said, hell oh, yeah, I have a traitor on the inside. He was loyal to Odin. He almost burned in that pot. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, 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 it wasn't made clear to me whether or not Kaido was aware of, like, who Kanjiro was. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You're, if, if that is the case, then you're right. Um, I think that scene was just reinforcing. Yeah, it. yeah. But other than that, uh, I'd like to see Momo escape. Uh, I'd like to think initially Momo's going to utilize the dagger to get out of his ropes. And he's going to be able to run around the castle. And I think he's going to meet up with Yamato before the Flying Six do. I... I, I really want to know more about Yamato now. I'm so interested in him. He is a wild card that we just don't know much about. Um, the best ideas we have is your theory that he doesn't like Kaido and what Kaido represents, and he's kind of like the black sheep of the family. Um, if that's not the case, I have no like inkling um, what his deal is. So I'm, I'm just pretty excited about learning more about him. And... Who knows, maybe he has some, like, fancy wood jutsu, because his name is Yama Yamato. Dude, does everything have to revolve around Naruto with you? Yes. Uh, but definitely, I can't wait to actually see Yamato, his personality. Um, again, I'm, not putting all, I'm trying not to put all my eggs in one basket with this theory, but it could be just confirmation bias, but I hope it pans out. It would be nice. But... Yeah, definitely an interesting character, but we're on break next week, so we're going to have to wait a little extra to figure out what's going on with Yamato. Yeah, boo break, but also I'm just happy that we're still getting One Piece regularly, um, despite you know the situation in the world. Like This is something that makes people happy, and it's, it's nice to, to be brought together with the joys of reading One Piece. Definitely, they have a lot of work to do. Logistics make everything hard nowadays with their current COVID situation. But I just hope Oda and his staff stay safe. And I'm happy and consider myself very lucky that we still get more One Piece. Yes. Uh, we will also be doing an episode next week, so stay tuned for that one. Other than that, that's pretty much everything for me. Do you have anything else? No, that's it. Thanks, thanks for everyone for listening, and I will see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to us. Thanks for sailing with us. Again, uh, we are on Instagram and Twitter at The Void Century PC. You can catch us out on YouTube at The Void Century Podcast and anywhere that you can listen to podcasts. Um, if you need to reach out to us, please reach out to The Void Century Podcast at gmail.com. And thank you for sailing with us. Bye. Bye.